Hi everyone, uh, welcome. My name is Andrew Apostola and I am the CEO of Portable. And I'm really uh, happy and glad to be welcoming you all today in this bright, sunny Melbourne day to talk about the psychology of work post COVID-19. We'll get into it in a couple of minutes and uh, we'll just await for more guests to arrive. In the background, I'd like to do a couple of things first. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we're living, uh, we're a team living and working on the lands of the Wurundjeri and uh, Boorong peoples of the Kulin Nation. We acknowledge their ownership of the land and pay respects to their elders past, present and future. We also acknowledge the rich tradition of oral storytelling by First Peoples, which has allowed for the transfer of knowledge from one generation to the next millennia. I'd also like to uh, recognize that we're presenting amidst the context of the upheaval and rest and unrest in the United States at the moment, and also acknowledge the challenges that both, both Australia and the United States face when it comes to dealing with racism within our communities. So, some housekeeping to get started with. Um, we're gonna invite you to add questions via the Q&A function throughout the presentation. So you can see that just in the bottom, uh, if you hover on the bottom there, there'll be a Q&A part of that. We won't be able to get through them all, but um, given how many there are on the webinar today, but we'll try to address critical issues or themes as we come along. And please also use the chat window as a space to share your thoughts, comments, to have discussions with the community. We'll be keeping an eye out for questions and comments there um, in both windows. But the the Q&A is probably the best place to put it. If you need any technical assistance at any time, please use the raise hand button um, feature on Zoom, or you can also call, call the portable office and our number's available on our website. We're also recording this session today, so if for any reason you don't get to see the full webinar, you get cut off, um, interrupted, or have to go back to work, um, and you'd like us to share it or to share it with your colleagues, then just um, reach out and look at, look at our website in a week's time, and we'll let you know. We'll be sharing some of references along the way via chat function too, so um, we'll be repeating them on the slide when we wrap up. And just a heads up at the end, we are going to ask you to share your reflections and commitments coming out of today's session. So please keep in mind uh, the question, what, I, um, what am I going to do as a result of attending this session today? I'm going to be asking you that later on, so just reflect. So firstly, just a little bit about us. Um, if you haven't come across Portable before, this is your first session, welcome. We're really glad to have you. We've been around for about 15 years. Uh, we're a design innovation company based in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, we, we have a mission to seek out policy failures and social need and create transformational change using research, design and technology. Um, and we're also a certified B, B Corp, uh, which means we're out there to create positive change in the world. Check out uh, B Corps as well. It's a great um, entity and organisation. Encourage everyone to be part of it. So first introducing our wonderful speakers here um, and we'll go to full screen in a few seconds. So you gotta see them up close and, and personally. But first I'd like to introduce Catherine Foster. It's a wave Catherine, just so everyone Hi knows. everyone, hi. Um, Catherine's our head of people and culture at Portal, um, where she's taken a leading role in shaping our team's response to the COVID-19 crisis among many things. Before this, she was a lead associate at Hudson and head of consulting at Insight SRC. She holds a Master's of Psychology from Deakin University, focusing on organisational psychology, which makes it very relevant um, for this conversation. And she's also a registered psychologist and on the path to becoming endorsed as an organisational psychologist. So welcome, Catherine. Look forward to the conversation. Next, we have our special guest, Gina McCready from Impactful Work, which is a consultancy Gina founded. Oh, when did you, how long ago, Gina? 2016. Three years ago. Still, still, still fresh. Um, uh, and uh, she's, uh, she believes that work should be enjoyable, satisfying and make a difference. Just like us at Portal, I think most of you who are attending and watching today. Uh, Gina is a strong advocate for the value adding contribution that psych organisational psych psychology can make in Australia. She was previously the national chair of the APS College of Organisational Psychologists and has a Masters of Applied Psychology from the University of New South Wales. So welcome, looking forward to the conversation. I'm sure everyone is. Behind the camera, we, uh, we have a team assisting us, um, the brilliant minds of Hayley Hewitt. Thanks away, Hayley. And we also got Jackie Bell, who we can't, we can't see at the moment, but um, uh, we'll, they'll be keeping an eye out on our chat and Q&A functions to bring your ideas into the conversation. So, um, if you have any, if you need any help, just uh, just reach out there. 
So in this webinar today, basically it's going to run for, it's going to be a moderated session for around 45 minutes. We're going to talk back and forth and, and have a, hopefully a lively conversation. There'll be time for a, a Q&A, so we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes just before the 2 p.m. and then we'll wrap up hard at 2 p.m. So if you've got somewhere to go around that, no, no, and be sure that we'll wrap up um, exactly on 2 p.m. So uh, that's how we'll be working through it. And into today's discussion. So basically work is a subject area that we've been really interested in Portable for a, a very long time. We released a report a couple of years ago. And if we think about, I guess, some of the themes pre-COVID, it was already being quite a transformational time to be working in this organisations. We've got automation and AI, which sort of require us to think and rethink job activities. Now remote work will give us even more to think about in terms of how we slice and dice our job activities when it becomes more of the norm. Uh, in a lot of our work, we've also talked about ditching the, the nine to five and the benefits that has for organisations and you know, a legacy basically of Henry Ford standardising work hours in the 1920s. A hundred years later, we're moving on. Um, work outcomes are what matters, not when people clock on or off. And I think definitely many of you probably are watching this now from within your homes and juggling children and uh, various commitments at the same time. And uh, some of you might be grateful to have that uh, experience for the first time. Flexible work practices, not, all, not always enjoyed by everyone pre-code, so I think it's good to recognise that too, but they're pretty much accessible and possible now. So and this is going to be essential to our future going forward. And I think the other thing to, to, to mention, in the, in, I guess, in the public realm is, you know, we've had ca casualisation of the workforce has been happening for um, a long time, but we've, we've been pretty um, stable over the past 15 years. It's, it's happened, it's here, and now we're trying to work out um, what that actually means um, in terms of who, who is casualised and why. And I think that's an important thing to think about for, um, you know, for in, in terms of the, the types of modes of people in, in, employed by their employers and how they're thinking about it. You know, we've got the, the gig economy also rising as well and those different types of work patterns. So all of these things are uh, the backdrop to how we come and, uh, and are looking and talking about uh, work and talking about this dis disruption that is happening. But as we like to say at Portable and as part of our research, um, we're looking at redesigning work, not people. And uh, that's a, the main tenet that we've, that, that's come out of our work going forward. So one of the um, more immediate things, and I guess kicking the conversation off, the people are talking about at the moment is actually people physically going back to work. And I'll, I'll start with you, maybe Catherine. How is the physical workspace going to change when they act when people actually come into their workplaces for the first time. I know that we've we've done it at Portable, but like how what what are some of the things? How is it going to change? Do you think for, for many people? Yeah, it's um it's it's it is kind of the hot topic right now, isn't it? As people start to prepare to come back, and I don't think it would be a great surprise to anyone to to recognise that um it's going to look really different once we start coming back. So I think it is worth talking about, even if it's just briefly. So. The physical distancing requirements alone that we're under at the moment mean that fewer people are likely to actually be able to be in the office at the same time, particularly when you start to think about using common spaces like meeting rooms or kitchens or bathrooms. In terms of us keeping apart, we need even more space to be able to do that. Um, you know, there's been 3D printing companies that have completely shifted their business model now to print perspex screens that can go between workstations. So, you know, there's, as I said, it will look completely different, not to mention temperature checking stations at the front of offices and hand sanitizer literally everywhere that you look. So that's some of like the, the physical elements. Um, and then I guess once you start thinking about people being back in there and you start thinking about the things that people touch, high touch surfaces like desks, equipment, like the biscuit jar, et cetera, then things have to be different again. And one of the things that we're probably gonna see is extra cleaning supplies. As people decide to, to be more vigilant about that themselves, whereas typically they might've left that to the cleaner, it wouldn't surprise me if we start seeing people cleaning their workstation each morning or night um, and for that to be mandated as well. And I think another thing that will be really different will be who's in the office and when. So we're probably used to all of us being in there, but that's, that's not possible. Um, and many companies are already moving to a roster type system where the same group of people are using the office on a certain day, obviously to avoid cross contamination. That's, that's how we're approaching it at Portable um, for those that actually need to be in the office. Like hot desking is 
pretty much gone. You know, you can't have a system where people just sit wherever they want. We have to be able to trace things and track things. So if there's an outbreak, then we know who's been where and who they've been in touch with, etc. Um, and so I think all of that means that we have to think really carefully about, about all of these things. And we have to think about who's coming back when, what it all looks like, how we're managing these things and keeping everyone safe. And if you're wanting to map it out or if that's, that falls into your responsibility, then there are actually plenty of resources out there that can help you help you to do that. And if I can add in on that, if you haven't seen it already, check out the National COVID-19 Coordination Commission's COVID Safe Plan. It's basically a really good document. It outlines all of the main requirements it need to cover in terms of getting people back into the workplace and also what happens if you need to manage an outbreak or outbreaks. Um, so that's a really good document. We're going to put it in resources at the end of this. It's also um, up in the chat uh, now if you want to copy it from there. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea around um, the resourcing. To, to ask you now about your plans, um, in light of what we've discussed, obviously with the number of people on the, on the session, we're not able to necessarily hear from all of you. So we thought what we'd do is do an online poll we're going to ask you to participate with us and tell us how you're going. Uh, you'll need to grab your mobile phone if you have it handy and open up your web browser, please. And the website you're looking for is Menti. That's www.menti.com. And when you get to menti.com, you'll need to dial in the code 583016. Again, we're putting this link in the chat. So click on the chat at the bottom of your screen if you haven't found the chat function yet. And I should also say in the chat function, feel free to be sharing any of your thoughts and ideas across the, the course of the discussion and make sure you click all attendees so everyone can see what you're sharing as well. That would be great. So the question we're asking, as you can see in the chat, is, oh, sorry, on the screen is how prepared are you if it's your responsibility or how prepared is your organisation more broadly to have everyone ready to come back to the office. And you've got four choices. It's a, a beautiful continuum from totally on top of this and we're so hot and good, people are borrowing our plans. Through uh, to, well, pretty much good to go. You know, we reckon we're sorted. Uh, then some are sorted, some aspects, but hey, we've still got quite a lot to do. And then for those at the very bottom of the continuum, um, yeah, it's on my to-do list and actually it's keeping me up at night. So be honest, where are you? Um, let's have a look and see what some of those answers are that are coming in. We'll give you a couple more minutes to, to uh, add in if you haven't already. Just um, while we're, we're letting people have an opportunity to contribute, something to take into account as well is uh, where your organisation's actually based. So many organisations are actually in office buildings, um, cohabiting, if you like, with other organisations. And that means coming back or bringing people back to work gets more complicated, of course. What we're needing to do is talk to property managers, other tenants, discuss things like staggered starts, varying lunch breaks, making sure that we've got some good guidelines around use of um, elevators, uh, stairs, communal facilities. And so all of that kind of takes another level of um, kind of getting yourself sorted. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind as well as your own plan. So don't, don't think in a bubble, think broadly. Uh, right, great. Well, um, looking at our poll here, uh, I can see that we've got people on a journey there, Catherine. Um, I can see we've got most people, uh, 62 uh, people in the some aspects sorted, but still a lot to do. And possibly no pressure on us, that's, that's why they're um, tuning in today. <laughs> yeah, I think that's reasonable, given that um, it, it is about staying home if you can at the minute, then uh, that's, a, that's a pretty reasonable uh, position for us to be in, I think, with the majority yeah. there. Yeah. And um, we'll be wanting those eight people in the uh, blue totally on top of it to get in touch with us later and share their ideas. <laughs> Actually, if you're in that column, put your, put your comments in the link in the uh, chat for us. Great. Thank okay. you. So I guess that's how our workplaces will change physically. And we've got a bit of a sense from the audience. And, but will there be anyone, I guess, actually there that's a, a big question I think we're all having as communities. Will people ever actually come back to working in the office? 
and maybe Catherine, I'll just start with you again if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, well, sadly, I think the answer there is not really in a big way anytime soon. So we've heard from big corporates in the last few weeks like Telstra and NAB locally and even Google overseas and our government departments too. Um, they're setting really low expectations for when people might come back to the office. And that is if everyone comes back to the office at the one time at all. So as I just mentioned, uh, here in Victoria, I know that there's people from all over the world, judging from the chat when we first logged on, um, we're all in Victoria. And here our Premier, Daniel Andrews, last week said, it's important to stay home and work from home if you can. And that's to avoid um, overload on public transport, overload on city infrastructure, et cetera. So uh, that message is clear. If you can work from home, then that's the right thing to do. But when organisations start to invite people to return to the office, there's obviously going to have to be a priority on the roles and the departments where on-site and face-to-face -face work is, is vital for success. So some of the first things that spring to mind there are like the customer service roles and, and call centre roles and things like that. And a lot of those actually haven't even been able to leave the office. Um, so they're the, they're the things that will have to come first in terms of people actually coming back if they're not already still there. And I think, Andrew, we have to be really deliberate in thinking about how we're going to manage a workforce that is distrib distributed and decentralised rather than everyone working together in one space or working across multiple spaces. And that isn't news that many people want to hear. I know it's certainly affordable. Um, our staff want to get back in there. Um, but it's going to be a permanent thing, at least for the foreseeable future. And so we've moved from having to find a way to cope during a crisis and we have to find a way to thrive in this, in this new way of working. Great. I think Gina and I have been speaking a little bit about um, blended teams over the last couple of weeks and how important they are and how important they're going to be. Did you want to talk a little bit about that, Gina? Yeah, definitely. Look, you know, blended teams are basically a combination of people working from home as well as some people being back in the office space. And, you know, the thing is, this isn't necessarily very new because we do know that teams and organisations here and around the world have been operating um, with sort of dispersed workforces like this for many years. And the good news is that there's lots of great research that's already been done into how to help people thrive in these sorts of situations. That being said, we do have to note that it is going to be a change for some people um, and it's going to be uh, another psychological change. People have already had the upheaval of being um, forced to work from home and now um, going, going into this new mode of working might be another round of, of change that we need to support people with. Um, the good news is, you know, there's plenty of research, as I said, out there around what sorts of things um, we know uh, make high performing teams in a virtual or a blended environment. And uh, even looking at things like, say, social psychology, there's a lot that we know about the importance of really attending to the social aspects of teams that are dispersed, uh, not just the work allocation aspects. So making sure that we don't get in groups and out groups forming, there's a whole bunch of things that we need to be doing to really make sure that everyone feels connected and a sense of belonging. So we really want to make sure um, that no one feels left out or is isolated. And this is really important, particularly at the start when you're first setting this up. Um, definitely recommend don't just kind of let it go and see what happens. Start as you intend to continue um, from the, from the uh, beginning in the way that you want the new workplace and the new arrangements to work. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point, Gina. And someone had just posted in the chat that not all, um, not all industries and, and workplaces can actually be work from home. And that's very true. But I still think that those model that that model in particular applies, and and another one too around um, uh, like a, there's a model around motivation and satisfaction in people. It's Desi and Ryan's uh, model of self determination, and it's a really simple one that can help people or help leaders in particular to be clear about like what do people need in order to feel engaged and and satisfied. And that model, we call it the ABC model, and that model posits that people need three things, essentially. Of course, we need more, but these are three good things for you to keep in your mind. Um, and the A stands for autonomy, so people being able to exercise a choice about how they come into the office, when they come into the office, what, what the new way of work looks like. Also, um, B stands for belonging, so that's the social connection that Gina was talking about, um, and that's really critically important. 
And C is around competence. So people need to feel that they're capable. They need to be able to learn and grow. And leaders can use this model now because it's really simple to hold in your mind in terms of the ABC element to make sure that people have those aspects and that they're ready for this blended world ahead that Gina was talking to. So, you know, questions that they can ask are things like, do you feel like you've got enough control in how you're going about your work right now? Um, have you got enough independence in that? Do you feel connected with the rest of the team and aligned with the work that we're doing? And have you got a sense of purpose and direction about what we're doing? And are you clear about that so people can be in control of their own outcomes? And also, are they, are they comfortable and confident with the tech that we're using? That becomes even more important now when we're relying so heavily on it. So it's, it's a good one for leaders to keep in mind. Gina, is that your experience with it too, or that would be your advice? Absolutely. Um, I, I think if you're attending to those things, I'm not saying you can't go wrong, but definitely, you know, you're, you're off to a great start. Um, I think, I guess, just to build on that idea, I think the other thing that's really important, talking about great starts, is you do need to agree the ways of working, how it's actually going to operate. And it becomes really critical for employees and employers to, to get on the same page about what that looks like. Easiest way to do it, throw people in a room, a virtual one, of course, workshop it, um, make sure you capture the agreements in a new set of rules, whether you want ground rules or rules of engagement or working principles, whatever you want to call them. Um, the sorts of things that you need to be making sure that you're capturing, certainly discussing, if not documenting, are things like what are the team's preferred ways to communicate via the different channels? So, you know, you've got all sorts of things that you could be using there in terms of IM, text, email, Slack, etc. Have a look and see which are best for what. Look at your meeting schedule. I mean, let's be honest, we all go to probably too many meetings, or we did. So we have an opportunity to refine um, that now and to actually think hard about which meetings actually need to happen and which need to be face to face. And um, do we actually need to Zoom for everything? We know a lot about Zoom fatigue, um, really draining people. So um, sometimes just you know a phone call is, is sufficient. So that's all about comm stuff. The other stuff that you need in your agreed ways of working really is about um, more on the sort of the work and the task side. So you probably all started off the year with some grand plans about what 2020 was going to hold for you and possibly you got that documented somewhere and you might have been working from that and in fact still working from that now. The thing is the world has changed and that means we need to have a good look at what's actually on that uh, collective to-do list and decide which of those things are actually important and priority at the moment and who's got the work allocated um, and how are we actually going to be able to get it done. Some things you may need to actually practically delay. If we know that to be effective in the virtual world, we have to have more time on communication and connection, we need to factor that in to our work days as well, rather than try and do too much uh, and get, uh, you know, and get too, too far um, swamped, I guess, or overloaded or overwhelmed. And that's some of the things that we're hearing coming through now. Yeah. Is a shift in thinking though, like maybe Catherine, if you want to pick up on that, yeah. Sorry, Andrew, what was your question? Oh, I just think it's, it's obviously a shift in the way in which people are thinking and organising and especially if, you're, if, if, if managers are sort of thinking about um, people as being, I guess, physically present, then, yeah. um, you know, what is, how, 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 do we, how do we shift that thinking or what, what needs to happen? Yeah, it, you, I couldn't have said it better myself. The, like, the reality is that traditionally many managers have, like, managed people by their physical presence. You know, I can see them in the office. I can see that they're at their computer and that they're working, um, we can't see that anymore, right? So there has to be the shift to managing uh, the outcomes that people are producing, not just them being actually present. Um, what's really funny about that in a way is that that is actually the best, uh, like the best practice way to define jobs anyway, define what outcomes someone actually needs to achieve in the role and give them the autonomy, like I was talking about before, to be able to go about achieving it in whatever way they know how and can. Um, and it's the best way to manage people too. So no one likes a micromanager, let's be honest. So um, it becomes even more important in this world when you can't see someone. So it is about making clear expectations for people and talking them through what you expect from them to actually deliver. Um, and I think the other aspect of this too, Andrew, is that like people can manage their workload differently. Like it's, they're not doing the commute, I'm gonna be at my desk from nine to five and I'm gonna you know, then commute home. And like you said before, We've had plenty of people with caring responsibilities who've had to juggle multiple things during that nine to five period. And that's had to mean that 
maybe I'll do some work early in the morning. I'll help the kids with the schoolwork in the middle of the day. I'll do this in the afternoon and, and swapping and changing. So um, that's, yeah, it's definitely a, a different world moving ahead. And I think managers need to be really cognizant of that. And the, the key point there is manage via, manage via outcome rather than like actual presence. Well, I think maybe a few of uh, people that are watching and also I think that's one aspect of it, but I think given that it's, we're living through all this and certainly our staff and our team of reconsciousness of, of how our well-being is basically going to affect some of those outcomes and our ability to do that and, and to perform well and be, be productive and happy, I guess. I think maybe Gina, I'll throw to you and ask, like, what do you see happening to people's well-being? How, what's going to happen um, given that, you know, what we know now and what we can expect over the next few months, maybe even a year or so? Indeed. Well, I think wellbeing has been a huge focus, quite rightly. Um, and we've been in crisis mode, really, haven't we, since um, COVID-19 hit. So it's been hard on people and wellbeing has absolutely taken a hit. And we've seen, the good news is, we've seen organisations really respond to that. Employee assistance programs, um, sessions with teams, all sorts of things happening. Upping the ante, really, from an organisational perspective in terms of helping to support employees through this, this period of change. And of course, the government as well has also input more money into mental health. So we're seeing this as a, as a real focus, which it needs to have. And it will continue to be a focus, to your point, Andrew, for months and, and, and years to come. Maybe this is actually a, a shift in terms of bringing wellbeing back into the centre of um, thinking about work and not just about uh, productivity. But nevertheless, we do need to prepare people for coming back. And... Um, that means attending to their, their needs from a wellbeing perspective. They're potentially going to be returning to an office with far, few peop far fewer people in it. Um, the shock, it might be discomfort, um, awkwardness uh, around people that are there, you know, people physically being together, used to being together with so many and now so few. Um, people that are coming back after working by themselves at home alone all of a sudden, you might even have a small number in the office, but it might be way more than what people expected to. So that's a shift. And then the fact that we're going to all probably still be using Zoom, um, whether we're in the office or not. So it's not a case of just going back and we can switch the cameras off. It really is just going to be an ever-present part of effective working life. So there's a number of changes and adjustments that are going to continue to impact people's well-being. So what it means, I guess, from a leadership perspective, what can leaders do? They just need to keep those check-ins happening with their people, um, making sure that they're coping okay uh, and making sure that they also know how to get support if they need it and also supporting each other and, and, and others around them with wellbeing as well. It's not just the leader's responsibility. It's also, um, I think, every one of us to look after our, our colleagues around us. And we know, of course, leaders also need to do self-care. You know, as leaders, we're meant to be role modelling. So if we're not looking after ourselves or we're working too hard or we're not taking time out to get that balance right, then um, that's not just not a good look, but it's actually detrimental and, and could impact our, our team outcomes. So important for leaders to do self-care as well. Um, I guess the challenge, of course, of that is, first, it's hard when everyone's working from home to check in, but now we've got the whole blended environment. What if you're the leader and you're at home and then you've got people in at the office? So, again, it can be tricky and complicated, but you've just got to keep it up. Um, we know the importance of things like psychologically healthy workplace, where we actually have an obligation as employers to make sure that we are providing that psychologically healthy workplace. How do we know if we're not checking in with people? So, you know, keeping that discipline up is going to be really important. Yeah. If I can jump in, Andrew, I think I just saw a comment in the chat from someone about like working from home can quickly become working from home 24 seven. And it's, it's really true. I think as leaders and even just as colleagues, we need to be encouraging others to, um, to kind of, to stop at some point. And there can be really, there's good processes and practices around um, shutting down your day and all those sorts of things. Um, but also that's balancing with, as I said, people will be working potentially odd hours so that they can make sure they meet all of their responsibilities at the moment. So we just have to talk to each other, like Gina said, and understand kind of where everyone's coming from. 
and what you know one of the other things about flexibility is right now people like we're talking about well-being right so people might want to well, will need to get away from their screens potentially do some exercise during the day that's one of the things that we should be encouraging making sure that people feel like they can actually get out particularly as it comes into winter and it's cold by the time we get to 5 30 so I think all those things are, are, are really um, important. And if people on the on the um, webinar today are feeling stuck, or even if you're listening back to it later on, are feeling stuck on, on the wellbeing front, either from a personal leadership perspective, or you're a leader yourself and you're not sure what types of wellbeing questions to be asking, there's, there's many great resources out there that are supported by evidence and, and proper theories, which you've probably figured out are pretty important to Gina and I um, and our other org site colleagues. So um, a couple of my go-tos are Superfriend, which is a local resource, and also Good Day at Work, which comes out of the UK um, and have all been developed by two of the leaders in, in the org site world for a long time, Ivan Robertson and Kerry Cooper. So. They're two that I really like and, um, you know, and still go back to to this day. Good stuff. And I really like um, Michelle McQuaid's Wellbeing Labs material. She's got a lot of good uh, toolkits, checklists and so forth. And also she has a five-minute uh, PERMA survey. It's a wellbeing survey. It's free. And um, if you're wanting to do a bit of a wellbeing check on yourself or encourage uh, those around you to do so, it's an excellent tool to use. Um, yeah, so I guess in terms of just to go back to your question, Andrew, about wellbeing more generally and how important it is, in relation to wellbeing, we have to be ready to manage a range of different responses. You know, some people will love this change to this next shift, some won't. So you need to be ready to manage that range. Um, if there are going to be redundancies, and we've heard today uh, here in Australia that uh, it's a recession, um, what does that mean in terms of organisations' abilities to um, reinvent themselves or to continue to survive and to thrive? We may end up having to lose people, lose roles from our organisations. So that, of course, involves you know grief, grief in the office when people realise it's not the same, um, and some of the faces that were there before maybe not won't be there. Um, given rounds of redundancies or, or other organisational restructures and changes. Yeah, it's, it's, I think there's a real sense there is a lot of, I think in people's personal world, a lot of tragedy, personal tragedy going along in that, their relationship to work and people are feeling that Very across, cool. you know, not only here, but I, I know there's people here from the United States and, uh, and Europe uh, attending that can attest to that too. I think... You just mentioned before we are you know we are we've been in a recession technically for most of this year actually even before um, COVID happened and it looks like we're going to be there further and you know the major economies are also going to be in uh, that too that obviously is going to change the we're going to see a spike in unemployment uh, particularly we don't know what's going to happen when the job keeper subsidy in Australia um, disappears or if it, when it disappears I think the you know the I think question a lot of people is going to have it and a lot of people ask is what's going to, what is what's the impact going to be on the market for talent um, going forward and you know I, I know it, it's an uncomfortable conversation for many but it definitely does that relationship that uh, that you might have between talent when you are the economy is fully cooking and uh, and you're trying to place very very high profile or hard to place jobs um, that that relationship might be changed now maybe Gina if you could. Yeah, I'll jump in if that's all right, Andrew. This is a, it's, um, it's something that I've always been interested in. And Go for it. <laughs> it is. Um, the, I, it, it's exactly as you said, Andrew, but the, the sad reality is that what's happened and the increase in unemployment means that there's, there's going to be a lot of talented people in the market. And those talented people may very well find themselves um, having to be open to different opportunities and not, not having another choice. So, I'm sure that most of us on the call, as you said, have been impacted either directly or they'll certainly know someone. Um, you know, if we think about industries, and it's not only limited to this, but think about travel, about hospitality, about the arts, you know, these are sectors that have suffered massively. And um, the people who have lost their jobs in those sectors are really having to be to look at like completely different job options, if not completely different career paths, because we're not quite sure how, how and when they'll recover. Um, and in looking at those different career paths, we've already seen a spike in the last few months in online learning during the pandemic. And um, with more people looking to reskill themselves, to, um, you know, to learn something new, to be skilled in something different, so that they're in a better position, basically, to get a job. And if we think back to the ABC model that we touched on earlier, 
people actually do need to learn and grow to feel motivated. So I think any support that organisations can provide right now on that front is, is a good thing. And, you know, there's so many kind of free resources with MOOCs and Lynda and, you know, the Mass Online Open Courses, sorry, and Lynda and all those sorts of things. There are, there are lots of ways that you can do that, even if the organisation hasn't got the funds right now to be investing as they normally would. And I know a lot of organisations are also curating or collecting um, great resources to share around as well. So I definitely want to encourage people to continue to do that. Um, the other, I guess, point coming back to your uh, comment, Andrew, about sort of, you know, the tough times uh, ahead and the opportunity that that does uh, create for the market for talent. The high levels of unemployment mean, I guess, the, the upside or the silver lining, if you like, might be that organisations now can access probably a broader range of talent, possibly higher quality talent um, than what they could before. Of course, that's all dependent upon organisations not having a recruitment freeze, which, which many do at the moment. So um, it's possible that uh, there might be some opportunities to pick up some, some great new talent to bring into your business. And also, of course, this cha the change to how we're working means possibly some existing staff might also have new open openings or opportunities to work from different locations. Um, yeah. So that might might open up a, a, a new spectrum. Yeah, it's a global talent pool that we're drawing on now. But certainly, I think you know we're seeing a lot of reporting around that in terms of um, you know, Amazon sort of broadening uh, a lot of a lot of the, uh, the tech companies in Silicon Valley are talking about the movement of jobs beyond. Uh, the, the valley now too, which I think is really, you know, opening up people's horizons. Like, do you do you need to work in uh, in San Francisco if you want to succeed in tech? And maybe perhaps the answer is is no. But I guess you know we're, we're changing our practices, right? So yeah, um, yeah, Andrew, can I can I go and work from somewhere warmer once the, once the <laughs> yeah. waters are open again? <laughs> 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 um, the change in practice that you touched on is a good one because this is ultimately going to change how uh, how we recruit people as well and that's that's worth chatting about so we we'll, I think naturally we'll rely much more heavily on video interviewing um, and whether that means using something like zoom or using something that's like prefabricated like higher view or something along those lines um, I think that, that we'll absolutely see a spike there. So it might be that some of those initial meetings are held in a, in a virtual environment rather than face to face to kind of minimize contact. Uh, and the other thing will be around kind of work samples and, and work tests too. A lot of organizations already use those kinds of things, but now it's about how do we tweak these and get people to do them remotely again, to limit how much people are kind of in a, in a face to face situation. Um, and when you tweak those things, you want to be able to do it in a way which doesn't lose the like the predictive value, basically, in terms of telling you how successful someone's going to be. So there's a bit of work for people like us to be doing right now to think about all those things. And one of the things I've been really interested in, because it's something that I am interested in anyway, is around psychometric assessment. And will people start to use that more? It is already really popular. Um, but yeah, I'll be keen to see if people start to use it more as something that again can be done without any face to face contact as a means of kind of getting a getting a bit of a read on someone. And Gina, I know you told me last week about one testing company who's um, who struck while the iron's hot and have actually developed an assessment of someone's suitability to work in a in a remote working environment. Yeah, that's right. Look, the assessment that they pulled together is pretty much looking for people who uh, get along well with others who are self-starting and who are fairly emotionally stable, um, which when you think about it, is pretty consistent with what the research is telling us is important for success at work anyway. Yeah, well, it sounds a lot like um, agreeableness and conscientiousness and emotionality to me, which are three of the big five personality factors. Um, and as you said, we know that they help someone generally, so they can be even more important in, um, in kind of difficult times. Um, but I do have a personal rule that's from, from personal experience that even if you're using work samples and online interviews and, uh, and psychometric assessment as well, I think you should always try and meet someone face to face, even if it is one and a half metres apart. I think it's always good to get a read on someone's actual energy, as I said, based on personal past experience. Yeah, look, hey, no, no disagreement from me on that, Catherine. Absolutely. I think, you know, there's so many cues that you get from that that interpersonal uh, interaction that unfortunately Zoom doesn't quite give us 
Um, the other thing, I guess, that's going to be really important in terms of sort of recruitment and selection onboarding processes is how are we actually going to induct people in this new world? How are we going to make sure that, um, you know, they have a great experience in terms of joining your organisation and yet virtual, so being remote? Uh, it can be very alienating if you think about it. Imagine joining an organisation and you don't have the opportunity to ask questions um, of the person or colleague sitting next to you. Um, you're not going to bump into somebody in the kitchen that you haven't met yet. So things need to be a lot more structured, organised, planned and so forth so that we can try and create those sorts of um, engagements. Uh, we're not trying to completely replicate the, the virtual world, uh, sorry, the face to face world, but we do have to do a lot more attending to that sort of social stuff, uh, particularly early on in the person's um, engagement. And why the social stuff? I know Catherine, I can read her mind. She's saying it's the ABC model, right? So think about the B belonging, you know, we need to make sure that people have that sense of connection as soon as possible. And so it has to be deliberate and it has to be consistent. I think it's, you know, the other side, I think it's going to be actually a probably a good thing like for a lot of those organisations that haven't thought about their onboarding before in the in, in a really com complex way. We, we're really going to have to really be have that lockdown solid, particularly if you've got someone just, you know, a thousand miles away or, or just down the road in, in an office by themselves. Like you can't just leave it to the, the actual, the literal culture in the office to move them around and induct them. So that's a really good point. I guess... So far, we've got a pretty good overview of some of the practical approaches. So that's, I think that's really nice and people like hearing that. Um, but I guess, what about the role of organisational values and culture? And, you know, are there any, I guess, practical tips um, to help on this front for people uh, as they go through it? Definitely. Hey, now you're asking the big questions. Um, look, my, my biggest tip here is go back and have a look at your organisational values and think about how they're best demonstrated and reinforced through this period. So what we're all feeling now, the climate, if you like, which we define as climate is the sort of the mood and the morale of people, that might be changing up and down, but your cultural values, your organisational values, they really underpin what you stand for. And, you know, again, you've probably seen them in organisations that you've been part of or, um, or visited, things like respect, responsiveness, accountability, those sorts of things. Those things don't change, even though the, the context and the ways that, that, that we're working with are. So what do you do with them? You need to be intentional in using those values as behavioural guides. So if you already have them defined and in place, now's a good time to revisit them. So you might have responsiveness as one of your values, for example. What does that look like now? It might be different. Responsiveness needs to be discussed to customers, to staff and so forth. So really honing it down into what are the sorts of key behaviours that we need to be demonstrating to live that value at this time. And it's really important um, to also realise from a psychological perspective that that can be really helpful to people and reaffirming to uh, just ground people in the familiar, which is those values that hopefully they had an opportunity to participate in creating, but certainly have signed up to in some way. Um, and I guess the organisations that are doing the best in this area are really those that haven't taken their eye off the sort of the, the cultural picture and they're really doing what they can to enhance their culture through this time of change. Yes, well, not, not, to, not to plug us and me, but we've, we're, we are actually... What are we doing? <laughs> well, we, like for, for us and uh, for internal, we are actually a good example. So... We had, um, we had our whole values workshop booked for mid-April um, and despite every being of my body telling me to cancel it, um, we didn't and we forged ahead and we did it virtually and it was actually excellent. So my advice would be don't delay this work, even if you've got your values in place already or if they just need a refresh like ours did. Um, it's so important to agree our ways of working together now and to connect people back to kind of what you stand for really. So it's important to have these conversations and you can get really good outcomes uh, in a virtual setting. It just has to be with a little bit of planning and a little bit of thinking about how all of that works. So um, you definitely can do it. And my advice is absolutely do. And well done to Portable for that work. Um, look, I guess in terms of summing up um, our conversation about organisational values um, here, the psychological benefit of having stated and shared values is immense at any time, but particularly now um, going through this difficult period. So the good thing is, of course, they're constant while everything else may be changing. 
So if you haven't already, think about how can you connect people or reconnect people into those values? So thinking about refreshing, reminding, maybe even reframing um, is also important at this time. Well, I think we could, we're at, um, I've got about 15 minutes left and I, would, I think, wow, that went very fast and there's a lot we can talk about. But we also have a lot of questions in the Q&A. Um, and maybe just a quick overview. Um, today we talked about some of the ways COVID-19 has changed the world of work. Um, and it's obviously not over yet by any means. Um, it'll continue to change, but we're well equipped to handle it, as shown by how quickly we've, we've I think lots of people have transitioned to and coped with our initial shifting to remote work. Um, we know what's important to people, humans, the psychology. You mentioned the ABCs have come up a few times. So we can factor into this how we design work and you know, workplaces of the future and rely upon those, I guess, those frameworks. Um, and I, the general point of, I think the theme still comes true, redesign work, not people. How can we, how can we continue to think about how we change our work practices around the, what people are experiencing right now? So Catherine and Jean, you've given us a lot to think about and action from today's session. Um, I think more broadly, to, if I reach out to the general audience now, what, what's hit the mark for, for you? Um, we've got our final chance now uh, to use Minty, Minty to share all of us uh, what you're taking away from today's session. So if you can go back to the um, uh, to the uh, menti.com and use that code uh, 583016. And uh, if people have just joined us afterwards, you can find, if you go back into the discussion chat, we'll, we'll repost it now. Uh, please type into Menti either single word like cleaning or very short phrases so that uh, big, big phrases will make it look a little bit messier. So try and keep it to one word if you can, and you'll see as they're popping up on the screen there. So we've got, um, I might throw to you, Catherine, do you want to go through and, um, yeah. and narrate as we, what you're seeing? What are you seeing? What are you, what are you, <laughs> well, what's you? making me laugh most of all, Andrew, is Catherine's cool haircut. So uh, <laughs> thank you to whoever knows me out there and who has noticed. <laughs> Um, but what I'm seeing coming up a lot is the ABC. So people are taking that away as a framework. And that's what I really love about that one. You know, you don't need to have a master's of org psych to be able to understand it and to be able to enact it. So that's really great. Lots in there about well-being as well. Um, well-being being key. Um, focusing on outcomes. Lots on values too. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is great because it's, I think it's showing that people are taking away the right types of things. Um, uh, you know, I love that boundaries is in there because that's you know when it yeah. comes to some of our conversation about being able to fit it all in our lives and and yeah. work in its in its place so to speak. That's great. Yeah, definitely, Gina. Um, and yeah, the culture piece as well, which is obviously the last part that we've talked on. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you. I love watching these things come together. But in the interest, I, I have seen that there's heaps of Q and A coming through, Andrew. So perhaps I'll. I'll shut this down now and, and, um, and back throw back, back to you. Yeah, I'll flip back to a presentation. Just if everyone can just give me a second and I'll just uh, um, uh, share, share our screen just while I can. Uh, sorry, if you're wrong, bear with me. Just find that. Great. We are Q&A in time now. So I'm going to throw it out to Hayley to have a look and talk us through some of the top rated questions and if you can uh, throw them to whoever you think is most appropriate or just the group that'd be great Hayley. Yeah uh, thanks everyone for sending so many questions. Uh, we won't be able to get to all 22 of them I'm really really sorry about that uh, but myself and Jackie have tried to I guess kind of merge a couple and look at the themes particularly with blended teams being um, quite a huge theme in there as well. Um, so I'm just going to start with this question, which is question two and question 17. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to get everyone's name. So it was just kind of easier to separate like that. Um, what will the future workplace look like? Will it get back to the way it was? What are your views on people who can work from home based on their role and their ability to continue to do so after the pandemic? And anyone may answer. Maybe. You, you go first, Gina. Okay. Um, so will it go back to the way it was? Probably not for most people. Um, or I think as Catherine said, not in a big way anytime soon. So I think um, definitely we need to just uh, be open-minded and embrace this, this next cycle of, uh, of change that we're going through. Um, in terms of, what was the second part of the question? 
Um, so the second part was what are your views on people who can return, um, so who can work from home based on their role and their ability to then continue after the pandemic? Yeah, great question. Look, I think um, it's going to be really interesting because people are going, or organisations uh, and leaders are going to have to make decisions about who can come back and why. So in some cases, it will be role dependent in terms of who absolutely has to be back. Sometimes, of course, it can be about capability um, to do the role away or, or not. And it can also be about preference. So some people want to work from home. In fact, we know many people uh, at least are saying at this stage they've loved it, although perhaps when they said they loved it, they didn't necessarily mean forever. So um, we need to kind of um, really work with individuals. I think this is a really complicated but great leadership challenge for people to kind of figure out, okay, I've got you know, five people in my team. How do I understand the preferences and the needs of each of them for hanging out with each other or the collaboration requirements of the role? And how do I mix that together? No easy answers there, um, but it can be done, right, Catherine? Yeah, I agree. I'm just having a little bit of a giggle because one of my former colleagues, hey, Wendy, has just posted that I'd prefer that the homeschooling part didn't continue with the work from home. And I hear you. I totally hear you. Can't wait to have my house to myself. But um, there, I think, yeah, I, one of the things that's been coming through in the chat is, is that there's actually been really good elements to this. So will we ever go back to the way it was before? Well, you know, maybe, maybe it's a good thing that we don't because I think there's some, some of this has brought a lot of teams together. They've had the chance to get to know each other better. They've learned that they can adapt really quickly and work in different ways. So in terms of kind of moving forward with some positivity, I think that there's good things that we can learn from all of this that we can use to adapt the way that we work and make it even better. Oh, that's a beautiful segue into my next question. So thank you so much, Catherine. Um, how Pleasure. do you encourage people to see the importance of revisiting norms, expectations and ways of working? These can cause frustrations in team dynamics and lack of productivity when they aren't done very well. Yeah, I, th I think the answer is almost in the question. So it's about putting that, that frustration and, and negativity back on the table in, in a good way to say, it seems like we're clashing on these things and it seems like we aren't all agreed on the way that's best to approach it. So let's have this conversation and it doesn't have to be something formal like developing a team charter. It can just be like, Hey, what do we want to do in this meeting and what do we want to use it for? Um, so yeah, it is about, uh, you know, I'm big on kind of naming what's going on. Right. And so talking about where we're, we're bumping heads here. Um, so how can we, yeah, how can, we, how can we fix that? And one way to fix that is to have the conversation about it and to agree the way forward. Gina, okay. what do you reckon? Of course, the smart thing is, is to talk about it before, you know, the proverbial hits a fan. So don't find yourself in those difficult conversations by having the conversation up front. Um, there's many things that we do in life where there's a bit of prep required or a little bit of a startup phase. And this is exactly what we need to be encouraging people to do, to kind of have those conversations before things get tense or there's some sort of dynamic. Um, I know some people are delighted to, to not be in the office anymore because they've got someone in their group that is a big talker and now they've got away from them, but now they're going to go back in. And so, so there's all these things. You kind of We've all gone into this remote world with all of the issues that we have um, as, as the teams we were before, those are still potentially going to be there or, or evolved in a different way, maybe even alleviated, but we, you know, it's messy. So rather than wait for it to get messy and then try and fix it, let's do something up front. Let's prevent it by having um, some conversation. And if people are rolling their eyes, and of course I can't see you all on screen at the moment, about, oh no, do we have to talk about ground rules again? Um, let's just remind people why. So, you know, sell the value but also do it in a fun way. There are heaps of fun ways that you can do it. Um, obviously, you know, one of the things I've chosen to do in my life. So um, think about what sorts of things you can do to bring a little bit of um, fun and enjoyment to the workplace when it comes to actually signing up for stuff. Use your creativity. Yeah, wonderful, Gina. Um, a lot of the questions were also, I guess, asking for references and resources. Um, so Andrew, if you'd just be able to go to the next slide. Yeah, I'll put them up now for the next question, yeah. Yeah, so that's all, um, I guess, the references and resources that Catherine and Gina have used to prepare for this talk as well. Um, and I guess the next question is, what tips do you have for encouraging a non-empathic um, manager to shift their thinking on adjusting people's to-do lists? Catherine, you're nodding. That's, that's the million dollar question, isn't it, Gina? 
<laughs> Absolutely. I was hoping you might go first. Um, the, just quickly on the references, um, these are the references that are uh, like easier for the general public to access. So there's more kind of like scientific references in terms of articles and whatnot, but it's very hard to share links for those because they're under access through universities, etc. So just wanted to be clear that these are the ones that you can get to. Um, but yeah, back to the non-empathic manager uh, and about shifting, shifting the focus away from to-do lists. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, and I think it's about, again, having a kind of a conversation with them about some of the realities about the way that people are best motivated. So perhaps educating them a little bit around the ABC model and, and making them understand the connection between people's motivation and the way that their jobs are framed. So um, it is kind of, there's an education piece to it as well as finding something that motivates them. So there's always the element of dangling the carrot. So um, they're, they're probably, they've got responsibility, I guess, for the people that are underneath them and their outcome. So you can dangle the carrot in terms of, here's the way that you can motivate this person or best, get the best out of this person, which is really what it's about to achieve their outcomes, which ultimately, ultimately is gonna help the manager that we're talking about here. So I think they're, they're two elements, but Gina, I'm sure you'll have something to add. Yeah, look, I would add to that. And, and part of what I do is coaching is working with leaders to help them understand what does successful leadership look like. And many organisations are really results orientated, you know, action, action, task, task. But that's not the be all and end all of effective leadership. And to your point, Catherine, you know, we want staff to feel engaged. We want them to feel connected. They need to grow. So managers that are just completely work driven are just going to turn people off um, if they haven't already. So I'm not suggesting you necessarily would go up to a manager like that and say, you know, you're turning me off or, you know, you're not, it's what you're doing is not working for me. But there's a version of that conversation, um, perhaps, that, that can be um, talked about. Who does this person look up to? Um, can you perhaps point out that that person they look up to has some social skills? Fingers crossed they do. Um, and try and see if you can create a little bit of a, um, you know, a, a, a pathway, if you like. So rather than saying, you know, I don't just want to talk about work, um, encourage them to, to see some of those benefits, but give them the why, and then see how you go from that. And the other thing is, you know, I talked before about psychologically healthy workplaces. If people are feeling, you know, um, dumped on in terms of work or overwhelmed, you know, they're supposed to be able to talk about it. And the manager is the first person that they typically, we would hope, might have a chat to or a colleague, um, someone else um, around the organisation. So have that opportunity, hopefully, to uh, attend and address it. If you're picking up on cues that somebody's a bit bored or, or you know, not getting through their work, um, bring out that empathy and go for it. Um, there are, of course, uh, as we know in psychology, uh, some people that just don't have a lot of empathy. Um, so there are some problems that we can't necessarily fix in terms of um, personality characteristics. <laughs> it can be taught though, Gina. I stand by that. We can teach people to be more empathic through their oh, behaviours. Yes, absolutely. No, <laughs> I agree with you on that. Uh, I'm talking about the tiny percentage at the other end of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. So we might, I think we might have to wrap it up there, um, everyone. Um, thank you so much to um, Catherine and Gina for your insight today. We appreciate it. Thanks to um, everyone behind the scenes and all our audience for being part of the, today's work. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks to Jackie and, and Hayley as well. Um, really appreciate you being part of that and working that chat and that Q&A I have. Um, just as we wrap up, we've... Uh, you can find out more information about Portable at portable.com.au. Uh, this is a design for education report. We cover a whole bunch of areas uh, from work to data to um, hacking the bureaucracy. And it's all based on our research that our design and technical teams do here at Portable uh, in Melbourne. And you can also find Gina's website, um, www.impactful.work, um, to find out more information and, uh, and, and to reach out. And there's also LinkedIn too, and I'm sure everyone here is sort of aware of it. So thank you so much. Um, I hope you have a really good day and make sure that you stay tuned for our future podcasts and uh, webinars in the future. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Have thank a great you. day. Bye. Bye.